Father, we come before you today, <clears throat> thanking you for all you do for us. Thank you for the many blessings you bestow upon us. Thank you for bringing us through another year, bringing us into the Christmas season. We ask you to be with us today, guide each one, touch each one in a special way. Help them, Lord, to get their life right with you, to live a life pleasing unto you, and to do the things that's right for them and right for others. We ask you to be with our country. Touch it, bring it back to you. Help us to have a revival in the land and let the revival start with us. Be with us this morning as we attempt to worship your name. We ask this in your name. Amen. 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 Let's turn to page 625. 625. Yes, Oh, 
Yeah. Very good. Oh, um, I just want to thank God for bringing us through another week, and I want to thank God for my son being here with us this morning. Amen. I want to thank God for His healing power that comes over all of us that are sick with sicknesses and diseases. Um, and Lexi, Lexi got sick again, so I just want to thank God for his mighty healing upon her little body. And I know that he's going to heal her completely, and I just give him all the glory and the honor. And I also want to thank God for bringing peace to our family, and, and I'm just going to continue to pray that he continues to bring complete peace to our family. And, and um, I just I just thank God that I I told myself no more. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna get in the middle of my family's gossip no more because it has to stop. So yesterday I told my sister it has to stop, and it's stopping with me. Amen. So Amen. it's good to self-examine herself sometimes. I saw her hand back. Yeah. Yeah. I just want to bless God for all He's did for me. I mean, He's He's did so much since I've been out. And I'm going on eight months getting out now, and uh, he's, he's been an incredible work in my life. Um, he's brought comfort to my heart, he's brought me direction, focus, um, did so much. He just blessed me with with a room, and he's, he's done so much for me. Um, blessed me with a job, good friends and family around me. Um, so yeah, it's, it's it's all because of him, and he's continuing to do so, and it's it's incredible what he what he has done. So I just want to thank him for that. Amen. Anybody else this morning? Want to leave anybody up? Yeah, right. Yeah, I just want to thank God for a roof over my head. Amen. Yeah. Yes, indeed. Amen. Anybody else? Want to leave anybody up? Okay. All right, if you have your Bibles, turn to Romans chapter 15. Romans chapter 15. We're gonna, this is going to be the last chapter that we do in this in Romans. The last chapter of Romans is nothing more than Paul greeting different people and so on and so forth. So we'll just we'll finish up Romans today with this one here. Chapter 15. <coughs> After uh, service this morning, we have a potluck dinner. So if you want to stay for, for dinner, you're welcome to stay. Uh, and uh, so, uh, <coughs> after, after. we then who are strong <clears throat> ought to bear with the scruples of the weak and not to please ourselves <coughs> there are strong people and there are weak people there are weak people because of things that have happened in their life there are people that are weak because their minds are weak. There's people that are strong. They're strong-willed. They're strong in a lot of different ways. <coughs> and how we treat the weak really tells us how good we really are. If we don't treat the weak right, <laughs> we are worse off than they are because it makes us weaker than they are. Amen. And that's something that we need to understand. We need to treat everybody basically the same. We're not to judge. We're not to look down on people. We're not to think of others less than we are. We are to look at everybody the way Jesus would look at. Them. It would be like if a mother had twins and one of the twins was retarded and the other one was okay and as these children grew up they could relate to one side but it was awful hard to relate to the other side because of the retardation of that baby so do you neglect that baby do you turn away from that baby or do you love that baby the same as you love the one who is normal? 
You love that child the same way. You love it the same way. Matter of fact, some people would even maybe go a little bit farther and give out a little bit more love. And it's hard for us to understand these things. It's hard for us to look at these things. But there are weak Christians. There are strong Christians. There are weak people. There are strong people. And how we look at our fellow man and how we treat our fellow man is a testimony to where we're living with Christ in our heart. And at this first verse, when we then who are strong ought to bear with the scruples of the weak and not to please ourselves. Not to please ourselves. Lead each of us, please his neighbor for his good, leading to edification. For even Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. So Christ took the reproach of all of us and put it on his shoulders and carried that to the cross. For whatever things were written before were written for our learning, that we through the patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. Now may the God of patience and comfort grant you to be like-minded toward one another, according to Christ Jesus. Like-minded. It's awful hard to be like-minded sometimes. Because we look at the things that some people do, we look at the stupid mistakes that some people do, we look at the sins that have brought people down to the pits of despair, and we preach a gospel of peace, we preach a gospel of forgiveness, and it's like it goes off a duck's back. That's what it looks like. It looks like water off a duck's back. It looks like the gospel just goes out and goes out the door, and it don't really touch people. Now the Bible says, the word will not return void. So you keep preaching it, and you keep preaching it, and you keep preaching it, and eventually some of it gets through. Some of it gets through. Does it get through the way I would like it? No. Does it get through... The way other preachers would like it? No. But it does get through little by little. And that we praise God for. And we praise God for each person that finds relief through Christ. We find we praise God for the people that try to get their lives better, to do things right for themselves. And it's a different road. It's a different road. Because the road that every person has started on every single person has started on has been the wrong road. That every single person has started that road. Because we're born into sin. That's why Christ had to come to take us out. That's why. So, anybody that says he's without sin is a liar. That's just like the Bible says. But we can be without sin. And when that happens, what is that? That's when we ask Christ to forgive us. We ask Him to come into our life and change us and make us into what He wants us to be. Then we are without sin. Because Christ cannot live in a temple filled with sin. He has to push that out. The Bible says that when Christ comes in, everything else goes out. All the old is done away with. Everything becomes brand new. You're a brand new creature. You're made new by the grace of God. He takes the brokenhearted. He wraps his arms around him. And he mends the broken heart. He takes those that are angry. Mad. Disturbed. And when they want it, he wraps his arms around them. And he takes that anger out. And he takes that frustration out. And he takes that pain out. And he takes that hurt out. And he leaves it. He leaves you with a pure heart before God. And that is what we really are searching for. That's what we as people ought to be searching for. Is the fullness of God in our life. It's what changes us. It's what sets us free. And that's what we all need. Do we all get it? No. 
Will we all get it? No. But praise God, some will. Some will. And that is exciting. For whatever things were written before were written for our learning, that we through the patience and comfort of the Scripture might have hope. But now may the God of patience and comfort grant you to be like-minded toward one another, <coughs> according to Christ Jesus. That you may, with one mind and one mouth, glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, receive one another, just as Christ also received us to the glory of God. Now, here Paul's talking about Christians. Receive one another. It's important to fellowship one with another. There are people that stay home from church and they watch TV and they do all this kind of stuff because it's easier than going to church. You can sit in front of your TV in your shorts and in your pajamas and however you want to. You can listen to the music. You can listen to the preaching. You don't have to put any money in the offering. You don't have to do anything. You just sit there and do your thing. I'll tell you what. This is me talking. And I believe this sincerely. I believe all these preachers that are on TV are going to have a price to pay. Now, that don't mean that some people don't get saved. That don't mean some people don't because the word goes out. And the word goes out and it touches lives. But they have done more in the last 30 years to keep people out of church than they've ever done to get people in. And that, my friends, is a fact. Thousands, millions of people stay home on Sunday morning rather than go to church and watch television because it's the easy thing to do. Now the Bible says, do not forsake the fellowship of the brethren. And that means sisters too. But don't forsake the fellowship. Why? Because we need one another to pray for one another, to lift one another up. Now in here you'd say, well there ain't very many people in there I want to pray for me. Maybe not. Maybe not. But there might be someone that you need to pray for you. There might be one that you need to pray for you. And if you're not here, you're not going to get that prayer. It's important to understand we need the fellowship of one another. We need the fellowship of the brother. And that's what church is about. Is taking and lifting up your voice to praise God. Bringing your petitions to God. The Bible says to bring our needs to Him and He'll take care of us. To bring our sins to Him and He'll forgive us. He'll give us a new life. Give us something worthwhile. Change that old life that was in the bucket of despair. And bring it out. And give you something worth living for. It puts joy in your heart. A smile on your face. You know, if some of you people could be up here and look at yourself the way I look at you. I could go around here and I could almost tell everybody here that is feeling down. Maybe down so far. I could point you out. Just like <clears throat> the person with a smile on her face, the person that don't have that load of sin on your face, that person that's left, that's left all the sins at the cross is different. They're changed. They're not the way they used to be. God puts a change in your heart. Puts a change in your mind. He changes the hate into love. He changes the discontent into happiness. And as we go into this Christmas season, wouldn't it be nice to get your heart right with God to start the new year praising God and lifting up God for what He's done in your life. I appreciated Sean's testimony this morning. To recognize that God does things in your life. And to share it with others. Now I say that Jesus Christ has become a servant to the circumcision. For the truth of God. To confirm, to confirm the promises made to the fathers. And that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy. As it is written. For this reason I will confess to you among the Gentiles and to sing to your name. And again he says, 
Rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people. And again, praise the Lord, all you Gentiles. Laud him, all you people. <coughs> we that are not Jews are Gentiles. The Jews rejected Christ. And Paul took the gospel to the Gentile. And aren't you glad that he did? Amen. Because without that gospel, we'd be lost. Without Jesus Christ, we'd be lost. <coughs> Our country has its problems. There's no doubt about it. But we need to pray for our leaders. We need to pray that a revival sweeps our land. But a revival sweeping our land don't start in Washington, D.C. It don't start in Virginia. It starts right here in the hearts of every person that is here. Lord, start the revival in me. Help me to be the one that you want me to be. It's important that we understand this. There shall be a root of Jesse, and he who shall rise to reign over the Gentiles. In him the Gentiles shall hope. Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. That's the verse right there is a good verse. Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace. I've been in some churches where you look out over the congregation and they all look like they've been dead for a week. <coughs> they, there's not a smile on their face. They look like they're angry. They look like they're in some world of their own. Matter of fact, one time it was so bad when we went to a church that I told the people, I said, I've never been in front of a congregation that looked this bad in all the years I've been saved. I said it to about a hundred people. And a couple of the old people smiled a little bit. But you know what? Before that service was over, they were all smiling. Before that service was over, something happened. The glory came down. Thirteen men and women got saved. One person got healed. And it was just an amazing change that took place in that church. It's amazing when God comes down. It's amazing when God lays his hand on a congregation. And I don't care if it's a church congregation, if it's a mission congregation, or what. It really don't matter. When God lays his hand on a congregation, that congregation will never, ever be the same. We don't see it much today. We don't see that kind of move of the Spirit today. And why don't we? It's because... I believe it's because we live in such a fast-paced world today that we don't have time to sit down and really study, pray, and bring our petitions <laughs> to Christ. How, how much do you love the person closest to you? Now think about this for just a minute. How much do you love the person closest to you. Do you love that person enough to pray for that person without ceasing? Do you have love enough for that person to maybe fast if that person needs to be saved? Do you have enough love in your heart for that person to get your heart right with God first? To show that person the right way to do things? You see, there's a lot involved in that. For those of us that have kids, we do anything to save a child, one of our kids, from danger. We do anything to help them along that line if we could. But yet, parents do not pray for their kids, and their kids just go to hell in a handbag. People don't care anymore. It's like they don't really care if there's a God or there's not a God. And that's a shame. That's a shame. Now I myself am confident concerning you, my brother, that you also are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, able to admonish one another. <coughs> 
able to admonish one another. If you see your brother in here, you go to him, hit him in the jaw and knock him out. No, that's not what you do. No. What do you do? Pray for them, you talk with them. You care about his face. The Bible says if you see your brother there, you go to them and you confront him, not in anger. You just confront him and say, hey, maybe you're making a mistake. Now, if they reject you, you turn around and walk away. Keep praying for him. But your brother. That means a, a Christian. If you see your Christian brother in here, you go to him or her and you say, hey, God said I have a heart to talk to you. The Bible tells us to do that. But we don't do that anymore. Very seldom. I'm afraid I'm going to hurt somebody's feelings. I'm afraid I'm going to do this. I'm afraid I'm going to do that. Where does fear come from? Satan. Perfect love. What? Cast it out, all fear. So if perfect love comes from Christ, fear comes from Satan, we cast out Satan. So we say, God, fill me with love so that I can get rid of all the anxiety, all the anger, everything. push it out and give me a new beginning so that I can share that with one another, so that I can bring that to my fellow man and share that with him. It's important that we do these things. That we, today we don't. Nevertheless, brother, and I have written more boldly to you on some points as reminding you because of the grace given to me by God that I might be a minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles, ministering the gospel of God, that the offering of the Gentiles might be acceptable, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> Therefore, I have reason to glory in Christ Jesus in the things which pertain to God. And I will not dare to speak of any of those things which Christ has not accomplished through me in word and deed to make the Gentiles obedient. In mighty signs and wonders by the power of the Spirit of God, so that from Jerusalem and round about Ligeria, that, that word is... Uh, Illyricum. Yeah, anyway. And I have fully preached the gospel of Christ. And so I, <clears throat> so I have made it my aim to preach the gospel not where Christ was named, lest I should build on another man's foundation. Paul wanted to take the gospel to new areas. He didn't particularly want to build on another person's work. He wanted to go in to a new area and present the gospel new. Present the gospel to people that have never heard it before. He was like, my, in my estimation, he was the greatest missionary that ever walked the earth. The greatest missionary that ever walked the earth. Now, there's been some really good missionaries, a lot of them, but they can't compare to Paul, not what he did. But we have to be missionaries in our own home. We have to be missionaries in our own place to present Christ to people around us, to lift up Christ, to take a look at yourself. Hardest thing people have to do is look at themselves. That's the hardest thing people have to do. To look at yourself... And then, first of all, you don't like what you see. And you kind of run away from it. Well, why not take a look at it, turn it over to Christ, and let him do it. Let him do what needs to be done in your life. Let him change you. Let him do what, you know. Over the course of 35 years that we've been here, several people have accepted Christ. they will never be back. Never be back in the mission again. Never do because they're they, they they're doing they're doing well. Now, do you if you look at it from all the thousands of people that we've had through these doors in 35 years, it looks like a small amount. But you know what? Every person that gets their heart right with God changes their life, changes the way they live. That is a blessing to the mission. That's a blessing. If you're here and you get your heart right with God, that's a blessing. That is something that God says, that's what the, the fruits of your work. And that's what it's about. And we deal with the very bottom. The church deals with 
the bottom up. Notice the difference of what I said. I said we, we deal with the very bottom. The church deals with the bottom up. And how they deal with it is up to them. But they still have to present the gospel in a way that people can get saved. And if nobody gets saved in their church, what are they doing? It's like a tingling symbol. It's like nothing. And I wonder how many churches in this valley today will have someone at their altar of prayer if they have an altar praying and asking God to forgive them. And yet, we say we love God, yet we say we love Jesus. We say that we're in love with Him. But we don't love our brother the way we ought to. We don't love the way Christ wants us to love. We need to reach out and touch somebody. And that's important. But it's more important to get your heart right with God yourself so that then you can reach out with the love that you can extend, you experience and tell people about what God has done for you personally. That's important. That's important. For I will not dare to speak of any of those things which Christ has not accomplished through me and were indeed to make the Gentiles obedient. The mighty signs and wonders, the power of the Spirit of God, so that from Jerusalem and round about that city, I have fully preached the gospel of Christ. And so I have made it my aim to preach the gospel not where Christ was named, lest I should build on another man's foundation. But as it is written, to whom he was not announced, they shall see. And those who have not heard shall understand. For this reason, I also have been much hindered from coming to you. But now no longer, having a place in these parts, and having a great desire these many years to come to you. Whenever I journey to Spain, I shall come to you. For I hope to see you on my journey, and to be helped on my way there by you. If first I may enjoy your company for a while, but now I am going to Jerusalem to minister to the saints. For it pleased those from Macedonia and Achaia to make a certain contribution for the poor among the saints who are in Jerusalem. See, we're to help one another. <coughs> Churches have missions that they support. They have missionaries that they send overseas. Do you know that in the last 40 years, missionaries have come from overseas? America very seldom ever before but missionaries come from overseas to America bringing the news of the gospel we were always the nation that sent out missionaries we were always the nation that reached out with the gospel America was at one time God based no longer and that's sad it's sad. And look at what happened. Look what happens when you take God out. Look what happened. I saw in the news yesterday they had a truck bomb in Somalia and it, at the last count 512 innocent people were killed. Men, women, and children. They showed them laying in the streets. Covered up but laying in the streets. That's what happens when you have a godless society. And it's coming to America soon. It's come here already in some degree, but it's coming soon. America will pay a price for turning its back on God. We need to reverse that and accept Christ as our Lord and Savior. It pleased them indeed that they are debtors, for if the Gentiles had been partakers of the spiritual thing, their duty is also to minister to them in material things. Therefore, when I have performed this and have sealed to them this fruit, I shall go by way of you to Spain. But I know that when I come to you, I shall come in the fullness of the blessing of the gospel of Christ. But I know that when I come to you, I shall come in the fullness of the blessing 
of the gospel of Christ. No matter where we go, no matter what we do, we can present Christ. We either present Christ or we present Satan. Simple as that. The last week or two of when we were working in the wood, I happened to run across two gentlemen that go to two different churches. Of the same persuasion. They talk about God. And one of them, smoking a cigarette, swearing. And then he looks out and he says, you know, I go out here in that field and I can just feel the Holy Spirit. Now, if they were talking to an unbeliever, the unbeliever would say, there is something wrong with that person. Talking to a believer, there's sin in that person's life. Now, one of them were here Thanksgiving night. And I had an opportunity to talk to him for just a minute. And he was telling me, he said, your men were so polite, they were so nice. And they didn't swear. And I said, yeah, you know, my friend, the Bible says, swear not, neither by the heavens nor by the earth. Keep your language pure. <clears throat> don't use God's name in vain. You don't need to put anything out there. You don't need to use anything to cutter language. You don't need to do it. Because that's sin. Now, whether he takes that, who knows? I don't know. But I had a chance to tell him that. So at least he'll be able to think about it anyway. You see, we don't understand the concept. If you'd have used God's name in vain 2,000 years ago, you'd have been stoned to death in the street. There would have been no trial, no nothing. You'd have been stoned to death in the street. What do you think the Muslims, if somebody says something about Allah, why do you think they go crazy? It's because they're fanatical for what they believe in. What they believe in is wrong, but they're fanatical in what they believe in. But yet if a Christian is fanatical, oh, he's a Jesus freak. He's this, he's that. But I tell you what, I'd rather be a Jesus freak than a sinner that's headed for hell. And I don't even like using that word freak because that shouldn't even be in the equation. Yeah. It's just terminology that has been used in the past. If you're going to live for God, live for it. If you're going to live for God, take the love that God puts in your heart. And if you have no love there, pray to God He gives it to you. And share that love with one another. And I don't care who it is. Share it with one another. Because that's the way Christ wants us to do it. He wants us to share the love that we have with others so that they can see Christ living in us. Because if they can't see Christ in us, they can't see Christ. That's just the way it is. So we need to present Christ. How do we present it? we got to know Him. How do we know him? we got to ask for forgiveness. God, forgive me for the sins I've committed. And I want you to come into my life and save me and change me and make me what you want me to be. And when you make that choice to live for God, your life is changed. It'll never be the same. And it's the biggest step you'll ever make. It's the biggest step that you'll ever make. Because it changes your life so dramatically. That you want nothing to do with the old. You want nothing to do with it. You know, I had, I've had several people play guitar for me. I had a man play guitar for me for three, four years. He's come to church. He's always battling the battle. And the battle that he battles is this. He knows what he's doing is wrong. But he can't quit it. And he lives in the past. Now, if you serve God, 
If you're living for God, if you're a child of God, are you going to go back into your drinking days and your bar days and glory in the praise that you got from the sinners that were drunk and messed up and tore up? No. What would you want to do that for? That's stupid. If you're saved and you're changed, all you want to do is tell the people what God has done for you to take you out of that life and to give you something worth living for. You don't give Satan credit if God has changed your life. Now, if your life is not changed, it don't matter. You can say anything you want to say. But we have to be witnesses to the people around us. We have to be witnesses. Because if they can't see Christ in us, they can't see Christ. That's yeah, something they have to really understand. Verse 27. It pleased them indeed that they are debtors, for if the Gentiles have been partakers of the spiritual things, their duty is also to minister to them in the church. Therefore, when I have performed this and have sealed to them this fruit, I shall go by way of you to Spain. But I know that when I come to you, I shall come in the fullness of the blessing of the gospel of Christ. Now I beg you, brethren, through the Lord Jesus Christ and through the love of the Spirit, that you strive together with me in prayer to God for me, that I may be delivered from those in Judea who do not believe, and that my service for Jerusalem may be acceptable to the saints, that I may come to you with joy by the will of God and may be refreshed together with you. Now the God of peace be with you all. Amen. You see, Paul came out of areas they didn't want to hear the gospel. They rejected it. They tried to kill him. They done everything they could to try to do him in. And God protected him. God had his hand on him. You know, we don't know when our next breath is coming. Some of you guys remember the old gentleman that the black gentleman that came in a few times, kind of raggedy looking, shaking. Well, he dropped dead in front of the police department this last week. He just fell over dead. And come to find out, come to find out, he had left the nursing home in Salt Lake City. Nobody knew it. And he came here and ended up dropping dead in front of the police department. You know, time. we're only one heartbeat away from eternity. Only one. What are you going to do with it? Are you going to give your life to Christ and let Him change it? You're going to live in the same. You know, people say, I go to church, I, I do all this. And then you see the anger, you see the pain. You see the mess that they're in, that they put themselves in. And you wonder how in the world can they present Christ when they're carrying all that inside. A person may go six weeks, <coughs> eight weeks, and do well. And then all of a sudden, they lose it and Everything they've accomplished is done away with. Everything they've accomplished is done away with. That's what one mistake makes. That's what one mistake makes. And if people believe you can sin and, and, and live for Christ, that you can sin and you can have Christ in your heart, the Bible says that the Holy Spirit will not dwell in the unclean vessel. Jesus Christ will not dwell in an unclean vessel. That vessel is your heart. That vessel is your mind. That vessel is your mind, your heart, and your soul together. And you have to make up your mind. Do I want to go to hell or do I want to go to heaven? And that's your choice to make. Nobody else's. It's your choice to make. What are you going to do with it? What are you going to do with it? 
That's a question you have to ask yourself. <coughs> what are you going to do? Father, we come before you today with a heavy heart of some, of some kind. Knowing that sin reigns in the mortal body. And the only way that you can get rid of it is by accepting you as Savior, changing your life, and asking God to forgive you. And we have men and women, Lord, that are so cold-hearted that they would rather die in their sins than to accept the love that you have for them. And that's sad. That is sad. And Lord, we pray today that your Holy Spirit will work in the hearts of each and every person here today. Help them to understand that there's a right way to live. And that right way to live is to be sin free from the fact that we know what we're doing and so therefore if we know what we're doing is wrong we don't do it anymore so Lord we ask you to be with each person touch each person put your hand upon each one and Lord keep them safe bring them back so that they might hear the gospel of the kingdom so that their hearts might be changed. We give you this day. We give you this congregation. It's a work, the work that you can do in their lives. And Lord, we pray for Jerusalem. We pray for Israel today. We pray, Lord, that your will be done in that country. That your people will be saved, that your people will fall on your knees before you. And Lord, there's going to be a big change made this next week. They're moving the capital, or they're moving the embassy of the United States to Jerusalem. Whether this is good or bad, I don't know. But they're moving the our embassy to Jerusalem. And so, Lord, we ask you to be there ahead of time. Take your, put your hand upon that move. Lord, we pray for the oppressed people that are in the world that are being persecuted for Christ. Pray for them, Lord, that they will lift up their, their hands to you and say, thank you, Lord, and stand true to you. And Lord, for the people in our country, for the people in our Senate, in our House, all the sexual abuse cases that are coming out now, that have been going on for years, and finally coming out in the open, Lord, we pray for a healing in that body of people. Pray, Lord, that you do the healing that needs to take place. Bring them to their knees. Help them, Lord, to come to you. Now be with us today. Guide us in all that we do. Give us good fellowship around the table. We ask this in your name. Amen. Amen.